In this video, we're going to cover everything you need to know about ExamP to get started. If you're new here, my name is Jeff Yang. I am a fellow of the Society of Actuaries and the founder of the Actuarial Nexus. The goal of this video is to introduce you to the topics so that you have a frame of reference to go off of. So if this is something you're interested in, be sure to like, comment, and subscribe, and stay tuned for more updates. This video series is designed to be very beginner friendly. The concepts are not difficult to understand, but there are many ways the exam can test your ability to apply these concepts. So throughout this video, we'll also go through a few examples demonstrating what types of questions are on the exam. As a warning, this video is very fast paced, so you may have to pause at certain points to get the most out of it. Exam P is a three hour multiple choice exam with 30 questions. The exam is graded on a scale from 0 to 10 with a score of 6 or higher resulting in a pass. Statistically, exam P is the first exam that most actuaries take. You can see that there are only three learning objectives. Compared to later exams, the concepts in these learning objectives are very straightforward. You do need to know calculus for exam P, but you're not going to need it until the second and third learning objectives. In this video, we're only covering Learning Objective 1, General Probability. For a rundown of the entire syllabus, be sure to check out the rest of the series when it's released. Alright, with that, let's get started. On a 30 question exam, from 7 to 9 questions will be on the first learning objective, General Probability. Learning Objective 1 is mainly focused on set theory with some combinatorics. Starting off, some of this might just seem like common sense, but we're trying to build up to more advanced concepts. Before we talk about set theory, we need to first define what a set is. A set is a collection of distinct elements or members. The notation for a set is written by listing its elements between curly braces. So if you have a set containing 1, 2, and 3, it would be written as open curly brace 1, 2, 3, close curly brace. We'll see how this comes into play when we talk about sample spaces, events, and probabilities. Moving on to sample spaces, a sample space is the set of all possible outcomes of a random experiment. The first example is as simple as it gets, a fair coin toss. There are only two possible outcomes, heads or tails, so the sample space is just heads and tails. In the second example of rolling a fair six-sided dice, the possible outcomes are the six faces of the dice, and so the sample space is the six sides of the dice. So far, pretty simple, nothing too complicated. In the last and final example, the experiment is drawing one card from a standard 52 card deck. The possible outcomes are the 52 cards of the deck, and so the sample space is all 52 cards in the deck. The reason we define a sample space is because now we can talk about events and probabilities. An event A is defined as a subset of the sample space, which basically means that all elements in A are also elements of the sample space. The probability of A is then defined as the number of elements in A divided by the number of elements in the sample space. The number of elements in a set is also known as the cardinality of the set. So going back to example one, if we define event A as the set of all coin flips that result in heads, the cardinality of A is one, the cardinality of the sample space is two, and so the probability of A, or the probability of flipping the heads, is one over two, or 50%. In the second example, if we define A as the set containing all even number dice rolls, the cardinality of A is three, the cardinality of the sample space is six, and so the probability of A is three over six, or one half. In the final example, we define A as the set of all heart cards when drawn from a 52 card deck. The cardinality of A is 13, the cardinality of the sample space is 52. So the probability of A, or the probability of drawing a heart, is 13 over 52, or 25%. Building on sample spaces, events, and probabilities, we can now talk about intersections, unions, and complements. To demonstrate this, we can visualize events using a Venn diagram. Going back to the second example with a fair-sided dice roll, we now introduce an event B that is the set of all numbers greater than 4 in a dice roll. Event A contains the elements 2, 4, and 6. Event B contains 5 and 6. The overlapping element is 6, so we put that in the middle section. This middle sliver is known as A intersection B. Put in words, the intersection of A and B represents the set containing all elements that are in both A and B. So in this case, it's the set of all dice rolls that are even and greater than 4, which is simply the dice roll 6. Because there is only one element in A intersection B, the cardinality of A intersection B is 1, and the probability of A intersection B is 1 over 6. A union B is a set containing all elements that are in A, in B, and in both A and B. In this example, 
The union of A and B are the roles 2, 4, 5, and 6. The cardinality of A union B is 4, and so the probability of A union B is 4 over 6 or 2 over 3. This probability represents the chance that you roll a number greater than 4 or an even number. The complement of A is a set of all elements not in A but still in the sample space. So in this case, the complement of A is a set containing the roles 1, 3, and 5. Similarly, the complement of B is a set containing the roles 1, 2, 3, and 4. The principle of inclusion-exclusion states that the probability of A union B is equal to the probability of A plus the probability of B minus the probability of A intersection B. We can visualize how this works using the example from earlier. A union B is a set containing the roles 2, 4, 5, and 6. A contains 2, 4, and 6, and B contains 5 and 6. The overlapping element here is 6, which also happens to be A intersection B. To get the elements in A union B, we can't simply just add up the elements in A and the elements in B. This is because the overlapping element, which is the role 6, appears in both A and B. So to remove double counting, we have to remove one instance of A intersection B. We also see that this principle holds true for both probabilities and cardinalities. The version of the formula you use is going to depend on the question. Typically, if you're given probabilities, use probabilities, and if you're given cardinalities, use cardinalities. Here's a relatively easy example using the principle of inclusion-exclusion. The question states that the probability that a visit to a PCP's office results in neither lab work nor referral to a specialist is 35%. Of those coming to a PCP's office, 30% are referred to specialists and 40% require lab work. Calculate the probability that a visit to a PCP's office results in both lab work and referral to specialists. So with these types of questions, which are pretty common, the question is not going to directly state the probability of A is, the probability of B is. Oftentimes, you're going to have to define your own variables and from there, figure out the correct equations to use. So here, let's first turn these words into variables. We're given three probabilities. The probability of referral to a specialist is 30%, the probability of requiring lab work is 40%, and the probability of neither lab work nor referral to a specialist is 35%. We're asked to find the probability of both lab work and referral to a specialist. So in other words, we want to find the probability of R intersection L. So this is a very straightforward question that uses the principle of inclusion-exclusion with one small trick, which you might have noticed already. We aren't given R union L, but we are given some information that we can derive our union L from. The complement of R is a visit that does not result in a referral to a specialist, and the complement of L is a visit that does not result in lab work. So the intersection of R complement and L complement is a visit that results in neither lab work nor referral to a specialist. From here, we can recognize that this is a familiar form of De Morgan's Law. De Morgan's Law provides a relationship between the union and intersection of sets, especially when complements are involved. So that's how we know to use De Morgan's Law in this case. We can now use the first of De Morgan's Law to calculate the probability of R union L. Recognizing that the sum of the probability of an event and its complement total 1, we can now apply some simple algebra to get that the probability of R union L is 65%. We then plug this into our original formula using the principle of inclusion-exclusion. We then calculate the probability of R intersection L, which is 5%. Not too bad, right? Let's quickly summarize the approach we took to solve this question. First, we took the information that was given and converted it into set notation. Then we identified what the question was asking for and converted that into set notation. Finally, we used the appropriate formulas to get from what was given to what was asked for. The approach is relatively straightforward, but if this is your first time working with these principles, it can definitely be overwhelming. Once you know all the different formulas, which we basically cover in this video, it's really just a matter of plugging and chugging. The most common advice I've seen to prepare for exam P is to go through a ton of practice questions. After working through hundreds of practice questions, a lot of this may just become intuitive at some point. Two events are mutually exclusive if they share no common elements. In other words, for two events A and B, if the probability of A intersection B is zero, then the two events are mutually exclusive. Going back to the dice roll example, A and B are not mutually exclusive because they share the common element 6. If we introduce a new event C defined as the set of all odd numbers in a dice roll, then A and C are indeed mutually exclusive. Two events are independent if the occurrence of one event does not affect the probability of the other event. Mathematically, this is defined as the probability of A times the probability of B equals the probability of A intersection B. Going back to our example, the probability of A is 3 over 6, the probability of B is 2 over 6, 
the probability of A intersection B is 1 over 6. So when we plug these probabilities into the formula, we see that events A and B are indeed independent. Although the math holds true, this formula is not super intuitive. To get a more intuitive understanding, we first look at conditional probabilities. A conditional probability is a measure of one event occurring given a, another event has already occurred. So going back to our dice roll example, let's calculate the probability of A given B. We've already defined B as the set of all dice rolls greater than 4, so the rolls 5 and 6, and of those two rolls, only 6 is an even number. So using the information from earlier about Venn diagrams, we can rewrite the conditional probability of A given B as the probability of A intersection B divided by the probability of B. So let's take a look at the same example using numbers. From earlier, we know that the probability of A intersection B is 1 over 6. The probability of B is 2 over 6. So the probability of A given B is 1 over 6 divided by 2 over 6, which is equal to 1 half. Based on this formula for conditional probability, we can now try and understand the formula for independent events. Earlier, we defined events A and B to be independent if the probability of A times the probability of B equals the probability of A intersection B. Using the formula for conditional probability, we now see that for independent events, the probability of A given B is simply the probability of A. And so what this formula is saying is that even though you have information from B, it doesn't change the probability of A. And so the events B and A are independent. All right, so now that we've defined a conditional probability, we can easily go back and derive Bayes' theorem. Starting with the definition of conditional probability, we can rearrange terms to get the probability of A intersection B equals the probability of A given B times the probability of B. This form of the equation is also known as the multiplication rule. We can also rewrite the probability of A intersection B as the probability of B given A times the probability of A. And now combining the two equations and rearranging terms gets us to Bayes' theorem. There are many ways the exam can test your understanding of Bayes' theorem. Sometimes you won't be given the probability of B, so you'll need to calculate it. And this is where the law of total probability comes in. To understand this, let's take a look at an example. An insurance company issues life insurance policies in three separate categories, standard, preferred, and ultra-preferred. Of the company's policyholders, 50% are standard, 40% are preferred, and 10% are ultra-preferred. Each standard policyholder has probability 0.010 of dying in the next year. Each preferred policyholder has probability 0.005 of dying in the next year. And each ultra-preferred policyholder has probability 0.001 of dying in the next year. A policyholder dies in the next year. Calculate the probability that the deceased policyholder was ultra-preferred. So in a similar approach to the previous example, we first identify what we're given and use that notation to represent the givens. If we let S represent a standard policy, F represent a preferred policy, and U represent an ultra-preferred policy, then the probability of S is 50%, the probability of F is 40%, and the probability of U is 10%. We use D to denote the event that a policyholder dies. So using the events that we define, we can also write the conditional probabilities given in the question. We're asked to calculate the probability that the deceased policyholder was ultra-preferred. So in set notation, that's the probability of U given D. To solve for the probability of U given D, we can use Bayes' theorem. The probability of D given U and the probability of U are both given. We now need to solve for the probability of D. Here we introduce the law of total probability. The law of total probability states that if A sub 1 through A sub n is a partition of the sample space and B is an event in the sample space, then the probability of B is given by the formula you see on screen. A partition is a collection of non-overlapping subsets of the sample space whose union is the sample space itself. So in this example, the sample space is the set of all policyholders who have been issued a policy. We can partition the sample space into three sets, which we defined earlier as S, F, and U. So now we can use the law of total probability to solve for the probability of D. Using the equation from earlier, we can substitute S, F, and U for A1, A2, and A3, and D for B. Plugging in the given values, we get that the probability of D equals 0.0071. We now go back to Bayes' theorem and solve for the probability of U given D, which turns out to be 0.0141. So in this example, we followed a very similar approach to how we solved the first example. The set theory questions are pretty straightforward, and this approach will generally work. To give you a sense of the relative difficulty of questions, this is one of the easiest questions on the platform, with over 85% of people getting it right on their first try.
If you're just starting off, this probably isn't easy, but with a little bit of studying, things should start falling into place. To quickly recap, we looked at the principle of inclusion-exclusion, mutual exclusivity, and independent events for two events. These rules also extend to any finite number of sets greater than two. So with three events, you can see that the formulas work in a very similar way to the formulas with two events. Because this video is meant to be introductory, we're not going to go through any examples with three events. If you want to get some more practice, there are plenty of questions on the actual nexus with three events. So that wraps it up for set theory. Next, we move on to combinatorics. As it relates to exam P, combinatorics is mainly focused on permutations and combinations. A permutation is an arrangement of items in which order does matter. So if we're asked what are the permutations of the dice rolls 1, 2, and 3, we can list out the different arrangements to see that there are 6 permutations. A methodical approach to this is to notice that there are 3 numbers you can put in the first position. After that position has been filled, there are only 2 remaining numbers to put in the second position. After the first 2 positions are filled, there's only 1 number you can put in the final position. So the different ways you can order this are 3 times 2 times 1, which equals 6. So to generalize for any set with n elements, there are n factorial possible permutations. This is the most simple case of a permutation. Now let's take a look at a k permutation, which is the number of permutations when arranging k items from a set of n items. So in this example, how many ways are there to arrange two elements from a set of four? So we can start off thinking about this as a regular permutation. There are n ways to select the first position. In this case, n is four. There are n minus one ways to select the second position. So three ways to fill the second position. And from there, that's all we need because we only need to fill two positions. So in total, there are four times three or 12 permutations. Let's extend this example one position further. So the question becomes, how many ways are there to arrange four elements in three positions? So we can start with our previous example of four permute to two. And for the third position, because we've already used two elements from the set of four, we only have two remaining elements to choose from. And this applies to each of the cases from our previous example. So the number of ways to choose three elements from four elements is equal to the number of ways to choose two elements from four elements times two. Although this isn't a formal proof, the formula for n permute k is the product of n, n minus 1, n minus 2, all the way down to n minus k plus 1, which simplifies to n factorial over n minus k factorial. In contrast to a permutation, a combination is a selection of items in which order does not matter. Let's see how this plays out in our previous example of 4 permute 3. In the permutation case, 1, 2, 3, 1, 3, 2, 2, 1, 3, 2, 3, 1, 3, 1, 2, and 3, 2, 1, are all different permutations because order matters. However, as a combination, these are all the same because they all contain the elements 1, 2, 3 in no particular order. We can draw the same conclusions for the combinations 1, 2, 4, 2, 3, 4, and 1, 3, 4. In each case, we see that there are six permutations for each combination. And this makes sense because there are three factorial, which equals six, ways to permute three numbers. So from earlier, we know that four permute three is 24. We also established that there were six permutations for each combination. So four choose three is equal to four permute three divided by three factorial, which is equal to 24 divided by six, which is equal to four. So to generalize, n choose k is equal to n permute k divided by k factorial. The most common way to write n choose k is with the binomial coefficient. The binomial coefficient is going to make a return in part two, so stay tuned for the next episode. So that about wraps it up. This video is meant to be a basic introduction. For a more thorough understanding, you're definitely going to want to do some practice on your own. If you like this kind of format, feel free to like, comment, and subscribe, and I'll see you in the next video.